Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, F. Scott Feel, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Stephanie Wyrock. We'd like to thank Ashley Redden for connecting tonight's guest with us a few months ago. We have on the show tonight a very interesting guest to talk about a unique topic, especially and selfishly for me in particular, because I'm very curious about this. But tonight we have on Dr. Britt Samolsky to talk about the DPT and PhD program at Old Dominion University and how to navigate an academic career. Dr. Samolsky is a practicing PT, a PhD student, and an adjunct professor, professor at Old Dominion University, very involved in research. So Brittany, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. Would you mind telling us your story about how you got involved in education and, and where you are now and, and your research goals moving forward? Uh, sure. First of all, thank you for letting me be on the podcast. I'm uh, always listening every week to you all, and I love what you guys are doing here with the podcast. And I also wanted to thank Ashley. She was one of my students, and she's graduating tomorrow. So congrats to her and her class. Um, so, uh, you know, I used to be in their shoes. That's how I got started here. Um, I went to my undergrad at UVA, did some teaching at the University of Virginia. I did some teaching there um, for gifted elementary school students in the area. Um, really found out I loved teaching, but I also loved healthcare. So I wanted to find a way to kind of marry the two. Uh, I ended up getting my DPT here from Old Dominion University in Norfolk in 2011. Um, and I loved my time as a PT student at ODU, always thought about returning to academia. It was in the back of my mind. Um, I worked in acute care for five years. Um, I was doing professional education on falls management um, for multiple disciplines within the hospital and had been working with a team of healthcare professionals on developing an ICU mobility protocol for our hospital and our healthcare system here in Virginia Beach and Norfolk. And I realized um, being a consumer of research was not enough for me. I wanted to be doing the research and influencing the field, but I honestly wasn't sure how to go about doing that. <laughs> um, so I went to our state PT conference here in Virginia, and I ran into a past instructor and mentor who suggested I look at pursuing a PhD. Uh, I always felt a connection with ODU and found out they were starting a kinesiology and rehabilitation PhD. So I investigated it, realized that the focus was on motor control, um, and that's just a really excellent fit for my research interests. So I applied, um, and so here I am. <laughs> I just finished my third year in the program, and I'm in the process of actually finishing my dissertation. I just started data collection on my final study this week. <laughs> Woohoo! Um, I initially investigated um, coordination dynamics of walking and chewing gum. So is it possible? <laughs> and what happens when you walk and chew gum? Um, mostly because I thought it sounded fun. I'm a huge believer that research should be something enjoyable. It shouldn't be something that we dread. Um, so it's really turned into this beautiful model to examine the influence of oral sensory and motor inputs to the movement system as a whole, um, as well as to investigate effects on aging, um, and how that affects oral and full body movement. So it just got kind of crazy. It started out as something fun and really turned into something big. Um, and I still do a lot of falls related research investigating how people fall, targeting mechanisms behind why head or hip injuries occur more commonly when seniors fall. So that's kind of where I'm at. I'm applying for jobs at universities soon. So I hope to secure a tenure track position at a university and continue both lines of research. I feel like your uh, dissertation was maybe inspired by a patient saying, what do you think I can do, walk and chew gum at the same time? Because I've yeah, heard so much, it's, it's so, so many times. But, it's so uh, funny because I used, to do, uh, I used to do patients in the ICU where I'd walk them. One of the treatments in ICU for gastroparesis um, is chewing gum. It's better than any medicine out there. And so we would get them up and walk them while they were chewing the gum. And so that is how it actually came about. And one of the patients did say to me, can I walk and chew gum or am I going to fall down? So, Yeah, I feel like that's something that I hear in my clinic too on a regular basis when uh, patients think that the, the activities I'm giving them are maybe a little bit out of their comfort zone. So I think that the studies that you're doing and kind of your future plans are amazing. It sounds like you know what you want, you are working to get it. 
So give us some idea about the ODU P DPT program and kind of what makes it a little, what makes it unique? Give us some highlights for that. Yeah, so backing up a little bit with the DPT program, it's very typical three-year program, three semesters per year. Um, it's a good mix, I think, of classroom instruction, laboratory practice, online interactions, um, there's reading and homework, of course, group discussions. One thing that I think sets us apart is that we do a lot of peer teaching. Um, and, and with the students I've worked with, I was a CI for several years before I came back to academia. I felt like they didn't get as much peer teaching and learning how to give feedback. So that's something we do here in the program at ODU. Um, and then, of course, we do seminars and clinical experiences as well. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the big things I think with our program. We have a clinical core that includes, um, you know, clinical sciences, patient eval, theory and practice, and clinical problem solving. We kind of put all of these together to help the student figure out, um, you know, what's the best logic to approach a problem as well as what's the actual best technique to approach the problem. Um, as far as clinical education, we split it up. We do in their very first uh, summer, they're gonna do anatomy and an intro to PT course where they learn patient care skills. They'll do a full year of didactics. And then the first summer after that, they do a cl one clinical rotation. They do another year of didactics. Then they do two more clinical rotations. And then they do their final fall semester of didactics with a final spring semester of two clinical experiences. So we try to pepper the two, um, knowing that students aren't gonna learn everything the first time they go through the curriculum. And so being able to bring it into the clinic, make it something very real, um, so they don't get lost in all of the material, I think is very helpful. Um, that's something I know I really enjoyed when I went through the DPT program here. Um, and as I came back for my PhD, the ODU program has seen a lot of growth. We used to be just a physical therapy program, um, and it's been a, the PT program has been around, I think, over 30 years. Um, but in the last five years, we've been able to start our own clinic here on campus, and we've been able to start a research lab. Um, so that's what brought about the PhD. So. Our focus as far as research is more on being an excellent consumer of research for the students rather than an independent researcher. That's more of the goal of the PhD. Um, but students do complete critically appraised topics. They do systematic reviews in groups. They do a case study paper and presentation individually based on one of their clinical experiences. So we do give them a lot of opportunities to sort of put their toes in the water in the different aspects of physical therapy, which I like as a general program. I know um, other programs look to maybe specialize a little bit more. I like that they keep options open for the students still. So. Yeah, for sure. And you know, Brittany, could you maybe tell us a little bit more about that PhD program? Maybe like some of the prereqs, some of the costs, uh, when you can start, can you do it while you're in school? Tell us a little bit more about how that uh, PhD program looks at ODU. Yeah, so ODU's actually got many, many doctoral PhD level programs. Um, the one housed with our PT program is called the Kinesiology and Rehabilitation PhD program. Um, but we also, within our College of Health Sciences, offer a health services PhD program. I would just um, kind of let people know there's always a macro view and a micro view to everything. So I would say the health services PhD looks at more how can you change uh, delivery of services and how services are applied within a healthcare system, whereas the kinesiology and rehab PhD program looks more into motor control, actual neuromechanisms behind what we're seeing as therapists. Um, and the main goal of, I would say, both PhD programs, but especially the KR program, is to generate independent academics. So these are PhD programs created to help people go through and become successful academics working at a university or some other um, area for education. So that doesn't just mean we're creating excellent researchers or instructors. Students learn about all the pillars of higher education. So that includes teaching, research, community service, 
and clinical work as applicable because not all of our um, PhD students are clinicians, but those that are do still have to participate in some clinical work. So all students are admitted to the program each fall as a small cohort. We found that that's really helpful. I was actually in the very first cohort for the PhD program. Um, and it was nice to have other clinicians to talk to about how to balance things like clinical work, families, uh, making sure we get all of our research done and productivity, because just like we have clinical productivity, we also have research productivity. Um, you must have completed a master's degree or a clinical doctorate to apply. Uh, the degree should be from a regionally accredited institution, and typically the degrees tend to be in things like kinesiology, exercise science, athletic training, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, and language pathology, or some other related field to rehab sciences. Um, you do have to have a minimum GPA of 3.25, and um, there are GRE scores and everything, but all of that is on our website if you look up um, Old Dominion University Kinesiology and Rehabilitation, PhD. Um, were you, did you want to know more about the cost as well? Um, yeah, sure, if you've got some of that information on hand, yeah, absolutely. So I was very fortunate, and a lot of the clinicians in our program, I know um, costs and higher education is always a touchy subject. It's hard to take out a lot of loans, especially um, when you've maybe started a life as a clinician. You have mortgages and families and all kinds of things. So it's a little different, I think, than going through a DPT for some people. Um, but I did look it up to you. The total cost of the degree, if you do it in-state, is only $30,000. Um, if you do it out of state, it's about 73, um, but our university in particular, we're a public university, we really find it important to keep costs down. Um, and I will say, currently there in the program, we have four physical therapists, an occupational therapist, three speech therapists, two biomechanists, three athletic trainers, three exercise scientists, and a biomedical engineer. So we're from all sorts of disciplines, 17 of us total, and 12 of the 17 are fully funded, meaning they're having their entire education paid for with a stipend. So I think that was also something that helped draw me to the program. It helped make it financially viable. Uh, and our future goal is to have all students fully funded. So I thought that was helpful. You can get teaching assistantships, research assistantships, um, and clinical assistantships, depending on what your area of expertise is. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a lot of cool opportunities coming down the pipeline. Yeah. What do you, tell us a little bit, Brittany, about the different types of um, institutions that a PT or PTA program can be included in and kind of what these unique, what unique characteristics a person should have or um, that they display when somebody needs to teach in these settings. So, you know, public university versus private, liberal arts degree versus a PTA degree. Um, a school that's an independent institution like St. Augustine. Give us a little bit of background around that. Sure. So I don't know how familiar you all are with the Carnegie classification system, but pretty much all higher education um, is classified according to the system. And they look at things like the length of the education offered. So is it a two-year degree or a four-year degree or some sort of hybrid? Um, whether the university is private um, and that can mean for-profit or not-for-profit. Um, it looks at whether the university is public-based on its funding sources. Um, it looks at the size of the student population, specifically what those students are studying, the level of research being performed. So sometimes you'll hear a university referred to as an R1 or an R2 school, and that's just referring to the amount of research that's being performed. Um, there are also doctoral and professional universities. So I would say for a PT program, you're going to have to see those at a four-year university um, as far as the Carnegie classification goes. Those are the types of universities that are going to be able to support something like um, the research at a doctoral level that, they, that is needed for PT. Um, versus a PTA program is gonna to tend to be at more of a community college level. And again, there are public and private for-profit and not-for-profit not um, schools for PTA programs. Um, and we're starting to see a little bit of change within 
education in general, it's not so traditional as it was maybe 10 years ago. Um, people are starting to get creative, especially trying to find ways to combat the student debt crisis. Um, but pretty much overall, you're going to have um, people with what we call a terminal degree. So that would be something beyond the DPT for a physical therapist. Um, so that would be a PhD, an EDD for an educational doctorate, maybe a PsyD or something. They'll have some sort of terminal degree teaching in the four-year universities. Um, CAPD in particular is pushing to have a 50-50 split in all of the faculty. So um, within PT programs, 50% can be specialists and 50% need to have that terminal degree. So that's why you'll see a lot more physical therapists in particular, occupational therapists, speech therapists, returning to school to get that um, PhD or terminal degree. Um, PTA programs, because they're at a community college level, tend to be able to work more with um, people who have at least three years of experience and um, enjoy teaching, and so there's a little less um, rigor. You don't necessarily need that PhD. Yeah, you know, I, I think you bring up a couple of good points there, Brittany. Like, there's so many opportunities out there, and there's so many options, and just breaking it down and seeing what's available to who and uh, where you might fit in is a really great start for some people. Um, and speaking of fresh starts and first steps, what are some good pointers or some good first steps that people should look into regarding academia? Like what kind of positions do you start out at and, and what does that eventually culminate in? Sure. So my advice would be to become a clinical instructor. Everybody's had a clinical instructor, whether you've been to a PTA program or a PT program. So my number one piece of advice to anyone who wants to get into any sort of teaching is to become a clinical instructor for your company, your clinic, your hospital, whatever capacity that you can support the education system, do that. Um, if you're nervous about becoming an instructor, I would highly recommend looking into um, the APTA offers two levels of clinical instructor credentialing. Um, these courses are extremely helpful. I actually did both. I did my first one uh, about a little less than a year after I got out of my DPT program. Um, the second one I did after five years of clinical practice. Um, and these courses were very central in helping me to develop teaching methods to effectively teach students in a PT curriculum. Um, it's the one thing to have a student in the clinic. It's another, I think, to assess what and how they need to be taught um, and to figure out, you know, it's very easy if you have a great student with no speed bumps, you all gel very well, but it's another thing when a student really needs um, a strong teacher in their lives, a mentor, if you will. Um, so these courses help clinicians hone specifically clinical teaching skills, and they really do mirror what CAPTI's um, looking for in the larger universities. So that's kind of where I'd suggest is starting as a CI. Um, so I also hear from a lot of people, I want to teach, but I'm not interested in pursuing a terminal degree. And I completely understand that's a huge uh, dedication to try to go after a degree, especially after you've been practicing for a while, which I do recommend. But if you're not interested in pursuing a terminal degree and you want to teach, consider um, getting involved as an adjunct instructor, especially if you have if you practice in a specialty area. Expert clinicians are always needed for smaller programs because they can't necessarily um, fund enough professors to teach every little area within physical therapy. So they rely heavily on adjunct instructors. So I would go to any type of PT program that you might be nearby, talk to the faculty and see where you can help out. Um, I have personally brought in a couple of adjuncts with me um, because my area of expertise was in acute care. I've done a little bit of home health, but um, outpatient was really where I was deficient. And I teach a course in clinical problem solving where we give cases to students and they have to sort of problem solve and integrate all the knowledge they've learned, whether it's through year one, year two, or year three. And um, I found it very helpful to have people who are actively practicing in outpatient or in home health or in SNF to come in and give their viewpoints on it. Um, 
Additionally, we bring in people maybe to lecture on the shoulder, for example, throwing mechanics, things like that. Because um, you can't expect that every single person with a terminal degree will be an, also an expert clinician. Um, and if you're interested in developing your teaching abilities, many universities also offer courses or reviews of your teaching um, and will give you constructive feedback to aid with professional development. So I have a lot of my adjuncts, if they want to give a three-hour lecture or um, try their hand at running a lab, I'll do that and have our um, development, teaching development crew come in and actually give them a full uh, review to help them with their professional development. I think that you make a really good point about making sure that if you are going into academia, that becoming a clinical instructor is really, really important. And you know, so, uh, another thing that we've heard on the show is that you know it's difficult for uh, professors and academicians to stay active and actively practice while they're in the clinic, while they are also teaching in a program. So what are some of your tips for faculty who would like to stay active in the clinic despite all the other things that they have to complete in the university? Yeah, I think that's probably the biggest struggle when you do move to academia. Um, I think the obvious answer is that adjunct professors have a more even split of teaching and clinical responsibilities than does a full-time faculty member. Um, but despite that fact, um, many of the faculty at our university here at Old Dominion University maintain their licenses and practice regularly. So um, everybody on our staff and everyone, I would say all of our full-time faculty members, I had to think for a minute, do have terminal degrees. They all have PhDs, but they still work regularly in either home health or our on-campus clinic. Those are the most popular options because they're very flexible with regard to scheduling. So that would be my number one piece of advice. Find a setting or a location that would support a flexible schedule um, because ultimately you are responsible for everything you need to complete at the university, um, but you do want to still practice clinically. Um, I've heard a mix of different opinions from various faculty members across the country when I've asked them this question at conferences, because that's what I always want to know. Um, since I started the PhD, what are they doing? Maybe I can follow what they're doing. Um, but I've heard a mix of things. Some people completely leave the profession clinically, um, and just practice in research and count that sort of as clinical practice by bringing people in and working with them on intervention studies and things like that. Other people still spend a large amount of time in the clinic. Um, but I believe that being very honest with yourself about your goals is the key. Uh, there's a season for everything is what I always tell everyone. If your goal is to be a tenured faculty member, then clinical practice may not be your priority while you're finishing your dissertation or trying to get hired or being highly productive to build your CV in preparation for going up for tenure to the tenure promotion tenure committee. That does not mean that all therapists who transition to academia have no place in the clinic. Uh, the truth is that being a clinician and a researcher can be, I think, very synergistic parts of your life, but it does take work. Uh, clinicians have this lovely ability to sit in front of a patient and solve problems second to second to help make someone better. Um, and to me, I always call that the art of being a clinician. The researcher is kind of looking at the big picture. I think the goal of the researcher is more and it is to attempt to measure and explain what exactly do clinicians do naturally. So if you will, measuring the art of therapy. The more you have a foot in both camps, the better your ability to work towards that goal, I believe. Yeah, you ladies both bring up some really good points regarding um, the bridge between clinical and academia. I think we, we've always kind of said on this show that there seems to be kind of an ivory tower and we're trying to break that down and really keep people in the mix as far as what's going on in the clinic and what's going on in the classroom. So there's a lot of work there still to be done, but I think keeping your, you know, one foot in, in, in academia and one foot in the clinic is a good way to do that for sure. Um, but, you know, Brittany, tell us a little bit about what comes next after you kind of finish your junior faculty phase, how can you progress your career in academia and move up the ladder, so to speak, uh, you know, speak a little bit on tenure and, and what that kind of looks like. How, how does the, pro the progression go? 
Yeah, so I'm actually applying to positions now, and I thought, oh, maybe this is very similar to how you apply for a clinical position. You go in, you do an interview, they pick who they want, so on and so forth. But there's actually a lot more to it. Uh, many of our interviews are at least a day, sometimes three days on campus. So that can be sort of stressful. I wasn't anticipating that when I first came back to academia. It was a bit of a shock. But um, it's interesting. So you will sometimes get you'll apply just like you do with your CV, your curriculum VT, and everyone will look it over. It'll go to a committee, and then the committee will decide whether to give you a phone interview or not, or uh, maybe they'll call your references. And then if you make it to like their top three choices or something like that, they will invite you on campus. So even the interview process is sort of stressful. Um, but so once you get on campus, you get your junior faculty position, um, you have to try to get tenure. And so to do that, you need to be able to um, publish, obviously, and um, put out other scholarly works. They never tell you, oh, you have to do this many publications in so many years to get tenure. It really goes up to a committee. Um, sometimes numbers are mentioned, but again, it's sort of stressful to figure out how much you need to publish and when you need to publish and um, all of that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm here cleaning my office. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's not, it's not really cut and dry. So once you go up and the, maybe the promotion and tenure committee decides, yes, you've done enough scholarly work, you've done enough teaching, you've done enough service to the university, you are going to um, get t tenure, uh, maybe after your first six years at the university, then you move from what's called an assistant professor to an associate level. Um, and so once you're at the associate level, uh, you have to continue to do research and teach and service just like you were doing before. Um, it's just at this point, you're trying to build your reputation a little bit. So kind of the level after associate professor would be a full professor. And that's very, usually very difficult to get. It's reserved for people who have um, more of a national or international, depending on where you are at the university, reputation. Um, but that's pretty much kind of the next steps. And so figuring out, I think, what gels best with your personality, your expectations for a work-life balance, I think that's how you have a healthy relationship with what you want out of academia, what you want to give back to the profession, and where you need to, um, you know, or do you really want all of those promotions? It's a lot of work, so. I remember when I was taking, when I was doing my um, master's program um, in PT school for my uh, master of science in clinical investigation, and we would sit in, in a lot of these talks where they would talk about the life of an academician and the competitiveness to achieve these various levels of professorships. And it is a very grueling process. Um, what is your thoughts about higher level positions in academia? What um, are some examples? What do they consist of? And kind of what are the criteria that maybe somebody would need to have in order to get one of those positions? So I will say it is very competitive in academia, definitely. But um, I like working. Um, I've enjoyed working uh, for the faculty at Old Dominion University because one of the things I notice is that they're more of a collaborative staff. Everyone really likes to work together to help with um, productivity and output and teaching the students. And so I think that's also something you need to consider when you are looking for what's the best fit for you. Do you like, do you thrive on that competitiveness or do you need somewhere more collaborative? And you know, I think there's both options out there. But as far as higher level positions in academia, um, so I kind of went over the more traditional levels of professorship. Um, one of the interesting avenues we've started to go down at our university here at ODU is um, looking at clinical professor levels. So just like you have your traditional um, assistant, associate, and full professor levels, they're talking about um, looking into that for people who have clinical expertise as well. So maybe someone has brought upon themselves national or international um, you know, fame and reputation, but they've done that through clinical means rather than publishing um, 
you know, strictly as a researcher. So our university has decided to start to reward that a little bit more. And I think that's an interesting new avenue. Um, I know a couple other universities already do it and it's been very successful. So I'll be interested to see how that pans out. Um, we also have our graduate program directors. So they're kind of the person who oversees the faculty within the department for the, say the physical therapy school, any type of therapy school. Um, and then the chair oversees all of the departments. So for our school, um, we're the School of Rehabilitation Sciences. We have a physical therapy school. We have an athletic training program. We have soon an OT program. <laughs> and we have the kinesiology and rehabilitation PhD. So our chair kind of looks over all of those programs and makes sure we're kind of working together and that all the programs are hitting their standards and that everything's happening like it needs to. Um, and then from there, we have our dean who's sort of over our whole College of Health Sciences um, and that she looks over like our nursing programs, our dental hygiene, our um, the whole School of Rehabilitation Sciences and all the other programs within that. So you can go as high as you want, but again, you need to figure out, I think, do you thrive on that competitiveness um, or do you want something more collaborative? And the beauty of academia is there's something for everyone. Yeah, I think uh, it's really cool to see some of those higher positions. And I know, uh, shout out to APTA President Sharon Dunn. I saw she was just elected to the dean position uh, down there at the LSU College of Health Sciences. Um, you know, Brittany, for someone who's, you know, just beginning his academic career and doing some adjunct faculty gigs, I'm curious to know what maybe one or two pieces of advice you would give to junior faculty members uh, you know, or something you wish you knew as a junior faculty member who's like just getting started? Sure. Um, so I started as an adjunct as well. And um, I think one of the things I didn't realize, I don't know how much teaching you do. Um, do you do many lectures for your program? So I'm currently teaching adjunct with Baylor University's new two-year DPT program. So um, I don't have to handle too much of the online lecturing. It's uh, a little bit more of grading assignments and stuff like that. And then I'm there for the, um, the immersion labs. Uh, so it's a little more hands-on stuff. Yeah, that's exactly what we have our adjuncts do as well. Um, and so when I kind of made the jump from being an adjunct to um, more of a course coordinator, it's amazing how much prep work is involved in coming up with the lectures and making sure the material is up to date and that it's supported through evidence and all the things we preach through our profession. Um, it just takes a lot of time. And so, you know, kudos to all of the uh, teachers and instructors out there who are teaching our students. It's such a time commitment, not something that I had initially anticipated. I love it though, so I wouldn't change it for anything. But um, that was, I think, the biggest change when I jumped from adjunct to like a course coordinator. Um, so I think, you know, think about, like I said before, what type of university you want to be in. I think it's interesting that you've picked um, like a two-year program, something a little bit different, um, you know, versus a four-year or a three-year program. You know, you, the time constraints may be a little bit different between each program. So you need to think about that from just a scheduling perspective. Um, but also look at your work-life balance. If you're planning to go, you know, move into a full-time tenure-track faculty position um, and you have two or three small kids and you know you've got six years to hit tenure, you better make sure you have support for the family as well. Um, I've talked to a lot of other young junior faculty. Um, I used to have this huge guilt about um, ordering groceries online, <laughs> as silly as this sounds. Um, and I totally gave into it because I just realized that's not as important as me being able to use that time for um, developing lectures or doing research or whatever else I need to do for my career. So I think just acknowledging your work-life balance and moving forward and accepting that you may have to modify some things to make it work with you and your family, that's number one. Yeah, don't Absolutely. ever feel guilty about getting groceries <laughs> delivered. That's a godsend. I love it. I love it. God bless technology. <laughs> I think that we should get everything delivered to our door. Oh wait, Amazon exists, so we do have everything delivered. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so another piece I would say you need to be really honest with your 
personality. Do you like having a lot of support? Um, and not necessarily hand holding. I don't think you'll find that, but do you need someone who's going to meet with you every week or every other week or every month to help guide you through the process of teaching your own course? Or, you know, do you just like to roll on your own without much support, but you're just going to do it and then get the feedback at the end? I think communicating that with whoever's um, your supervisor or your mentor is super important. On that note, get a mentor. <laughs> um, and, you know, when I transitioned from a fully clinical position to academia, I uh, made sure I got a mentor. But I have a mentor in research. I have a teaching mentor. I have a service mentor. So I have all these different people I've, you know, aligned myself with um, to help me make decisions in each area of that sort of academic, the four academic pillars. And are those mentors all on campus there, Brittany, or are they all over the country? Um, no, so some, most of them are on campus. I kind of have my campus ones, but then as I've gone to more conferences and met more people, my network has grown and I do have mentors all over the country now, and I find that really helpful. Um, it's really helped broaden my perspective on just how we practice, how we teach everything. Um, and it helped me be really honest with what level of support I needed as a, um, not just a PhD student, but also as an instructor at the university. So now if I feel like I need support, I'm not afraid to ask for it and vice versa. If I'm getting too much support, I also know when to say, Hey, I've got this. Um, so that sometimes can be difficult. If you're, um, moving to, uh, like a tenure track position, one of the things I would recommend to anyone looking for a job about to become junior faculty or maybe you're looking at a PhD program and you want to go the whole tenure track um, it's really hard when you move from Brittany, your PhD. Hold, hold that thought for just a minute I'm yeah. gonna send you another zoom link this one's okay. about all right I'll see you guys in a minute all right